Uh, so my name is uh, Jiří Benz. Uh, I'm from Red Hat uh, Czech Republic. And uh, first kernel lighting talk is not so much about kernel. It's more about the protocol, uh, which is uh, partially implemented in the kernel or need kernel support. So precision time protocol is used for synchronization of clocks over network, which is quite obvious. <coughs> but uh, what makes this protocol unique is uh, the precision that it is able to achieve, which is in order of, of uh, hundreds of nano, nano, nanoseconds. <coughs> Originally, it was developed for measurement and control systems, but increasingly, it's used in other areas as well. It's defined by IEEE 1588, uh, international standard with two versions, so which basically the second one is the interesting one from 2008. Uh, the PTP uh, architecture is uh, basically uh, the computers that are part of the networks uh, form a tree with a master slave hierarchy uh, and it can work across several different transport layers defined in the standard, uh, UDP, Ethernet, and uh, several various uh, measurement and control, uh, system, control networks. Uh, it uses multicast, multicast messages, which uh, is quite important because it limits it, its usage in uh, older infrastructure. The principle, uh, the principle again, sorry, the principle behind uh, PTP is a periodical measurement of the latency between master and slaves, and uh, this is achieved by including timestamps of the transmit and uh, receive uh, of the messages uh, in the messages itself them, themselves. So. Uh, PTP defines uh, basically two kinds of clocks. The first kind is ordinary, cl ordinary clock. This is a device that has a single PTP port and uh, it acts either as a source of the clock or the receiver of the clock, so master, master or slave. The second kind of clock is boundary clock, which bridges time information between two different networking segments. And uh, it can also bridges over different, uh, different protocols or different uh, network uh, systems. So my, uh, I already uh, said that uh, the topology is uh, based on master, master and slaves. So, uh, Okay, let me skip one slide. I will return to that uh, to, to this one later. Uh, so this is one example of uh, the topology. Uh, we can see that the at the root of uh, the tree is a clock called CanMaster, and uh, uh, that works. Yeah, here. And uh, this one has a single port uh, to which. Uh, it, two slaves are connected. This is a boundary clock. It has two uh, PTP ports. One is going upwards in the hierarchy. One is going downstairs. Uh, so in this, uh, in this uh, picture, the port that is at the top is slave. The port that is at the bottom is master. Uh, the master and slave uh, is selected uh, dynamically. Uh, yeah, using the best master clock algorithm. Uh, this is executed independently by each device participating in the network, and uh, the, uh, the result of the algorithm is uh, whether the given port should be put in the master or slave mode. Uh, basically, the the algorithm compares uh, the, uh, the reliability and ac accuracy of time sources of different devices and select the device that has the most precise and most accurate clocks. 
uh, the algorithm is run continuously, and uh, when uh, the networking topology changes or the or a device disappears, then uh, the then this uh, logical uh, tree hierarchy is recomputed and uh, adjusted. Okay. So time stamping. Uh, every, not every, uh, certain kinds of um, PTP messages uh, include timestamps that are generated uh, when the message hit the wire, hits the wire. This is important because uh, when, if uh, we generate the, the timestamp uh, earlier than that, then we would introduce uh, some possibly unknown latency uh, between the message was passed to the networking protocol stack and uh, the, before the time the message is actually transmitted. Because of that, the timestamp is generated in hardware and it's either directly embedded in the outgoing message or uh, it's sent or it's returned by the hardware back to the driver and it's sent in a follow-up message uh, which uh, can be used by the receiver to compute uh, the, the delay. Uh, similarly, the incoming messages are timestamping by hardware and the uh, timestamp is made available to the driver and uh, this can be used to compute the delay between the message was transmitted and received. Okay. Of course, it's possible to use software timestamping. That means if we have hardware that doesn't support hardware timestamping, we can emulate that somehow by uh, uh, computing or marking the timestamp in software in the networking stack. Uh, of course, we want to do that as close as possible to actual transmission, uh, but still there are unknown variables like uh, we don't know how much time uh, the message is going to spend in the network, networking hardware queue and so on. So software timestamping is possible, but the precision is worse. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, achieve sub-microsecond sub precision with software timestamping. Uh, another thing, another type of clock that I haven't mentioned is uh, transparent clock. That's uh, actually a network component that uh, is able to compensate for, for delays introducing by switches and so on. Because every active component like a networking switch and so on, uh, of course, do, uh, of course, does uh, queuing of uh, incoming packets uh, because of congestions and other stuff. So uh, every switch, every, uh, acti every router and so on in the, in the communication path increases uh, latency and transparent clocks are uh, designed to actually eliminate the latency by measuring the time that was spent inside a device and compensate for that. So in Linux kernel, uh, the implementation is uh, made using POSIX clocks uh, and uh, PTP driver that uses this infrastructure. And uh, there is a character device available under slash dev called slash dev PTP zero and so on. And uh, by opening this device and using that for uh, POSIX uh, timers, IOCTLs, we can uh, adjust the clock from the user space, like adjust the frequency, adjust uh, the, the absolute value and so on. This support was introduced in kernel 3.0. And uh, since that time, support was added to numerous drivers of this. Uh, for at this time, I, th I believe that most of the networking drivers has also support for, uh, for software timestamping. 
And there is also support for some of the cards for PPS, post per second infrastructure, that in theory should give uh, even better, better precision uh, in synchronization between the uh, internal clock embedded in the card and system clock. So for user space, <coughs> there are several projects available for synchronization of uh, the clocks. Uh, that's uh, PTPD, PTPD V2, and maybe some more else. But uh, the, one, the one that is most interesting is Linux PTP. And also there is a support uh, in its tool for querying uh, timestamping capabilities of uh, the devices. So for Linux PTP, uh, Linux PTP consists of several uh, binaries or several programs. Two of the most interesting and important are PTP4L, like PTP4 Linux, and PHC2Sys. That's uh, PTP hardware clock to system clock. So P uh, the role of PTP4L uh, is to implement ordinary and boundary clock according to the standard. Uh, what it does is uh, it tries or it synchronizes the uh, PHC time, that is the internal clock uh, in the networking hardware, uh, with the grandmaster clock. Also, PTP4L runs the grandmaster, uh, best master clock algorithm and uh, cares, of such, cares of more things like uh, management messages and so on. PHC2 says uh, synchronizes between the uh, internal clock card, in, sorry, internet, internal uh, networking card clock and system clock, both ways uh, according to ways it is invoked. So this is important to realize that we need both of those two demons because with PTP4L only we do, do not synchronize the, the system clock only the, the internal clock in the networking hardware. Uh, as for Fedora and rail support, uh, Fedora 18 uh, contains PTP4L or Linux PTP uh, package, contains uh, kernel support, and it should work basically out of box. Uh, rail 6.4 uh, includes PTP as a tech preview and only for a limited set of drivers. So, upstream, the kernel part is considered stable. Uh, the number of drivers supporting PTP is increasing. And the user space part, the Linux PTP uh, project is still in development and patches are certainly welcome. A uh, few examples. Uh, querying of uh, software or of timestamping uh, capabilities. This particular card support only software timestamping, as can be seen here in this, uh, in this uh, output. There is no support for PTP hardware clock, and there is yeah, no support for hardware timestamping. This is more interesting example. That's a card that's, I think that's IXGB card that supports hardware timestamping as well as software timestamping. And so, so it supports hardware, tam hardware transmit uh, uh, timestamping, hardware receive timestamping, uh, time and so on. And it contains one uh, PHC clock. This is an example of PTP for a session on this particular uh, card invoked on uh, ETH0 uh, e e uh, interface and uh, dash M is just output to, to not to the syslog but uh, to the console. And here we see that it found, found a master clock. Here this is invocation of best master clock algorithm that selected the just found master clock as the best one and synchronizes to that clock. The first column is uh, 
the most interesting one from this uh, debug or the, for this output. And it actually shows the offset between the master and the slave in nanoseconds. So as we see, the precision of uh, this synchronization is quite high. And that's it. And I think we don't have time for questions, so thank you. And <laughs> <laughs> My name is Yuri Gurko, and uh, I want to update you on, on the project I've, I've been working on, the Network Team Driver project. Uh, I had a presentation last year about the, about, about the topic. Just one question at the beginning. Who of you uh, were last year here and attended the, the talk? Okay, a couple of hands. Okay. So, yeah, I, I want to just uh, to tell you what's, what's, what's that, what's done, and what is planned for the future. So, here is just, uh, just two examples of link aggregation setups, so you, get, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, on the left side, the, uh, the simple example is you have uh, four desktop computers, you have one server computer, and you have switch in between. And as you can see, the server is connected via two uh, Ethernet lines to the switch. And there is where the network aggregation takes place. So uh, for example, uh, this can be used to maximize the, or to, to achieve the bigger throughput to the, uh, to the desktop machines that, uh, than over a single line. And on the, on the right side, you can see a more complicated uh, network topology. Uh, there are two servers here, and as you can see, uh, both of them are, is connected to via one line to the one core switch, and via a second line to the second core switch. And in this particular example, uh, you can achieve a failover even if uh, one of the switches fails. So this is not uh, only if the one link or uh, the, the cable is disrupted, as in this case, but even if one switch uh, breaks. So the traffic goes uh, through, through uh, without any disruption. Uh, this, this link aggregation I'm talking about is on the, on the link layer. So uh, all the computers in this, uh, in this network have uh, uh, IP address from this from the same uh, from the same subnet. Okay. Um, so this is just an overview uh, for the Team Driver project. You can see all the information on the web. Uh, the Team Driver tries to provide an alternative to the existing bonding driver. And uh, obviously, it implements various kinds of link ag aggregation, as I said on the, uh, on the previous slide. Uh, the kernel part uh, has only one interface uh, to user space, and that's called Team Netlink. It uses generic Netlink. It, it's, it's quite simple. So the, the goal was to, uh, to minimize the, uh, the API difference uh, because, for example, bonding has, uh, I don't know, four or f five 
uh, interfaces from kernel to, to user space. It's quite confusing. Uh, I want to say that the minimum of the code runs in the kernel space. That was the goal, to just do the fast uh, path, uh, the necessary things in kernel, and do the everything which can be done in, in user space, just do it in user space. Uh, and I, I want to mention that uh, it, in, it, this approach introduces no performance penalty because, as I said, the, the fast path uh, for the packets are in kernel. So the, the packets which are going out and in never actually leave the kernel space. And uh, the whole control logic is implemented in, in user space daemon, which is called team D. And that's where the where the slow stuff happens. Uh, current status is that uh, version one of libteam is in a stable repository for uh, Fedora 17 and 18. And uh, there was recently some work on packaging libteam for Debian. Also, uh, the K kdump package supports uh, dumping over over team driver uh, in current row height and it will be in Fedora 19. Okay. So there here I want to show you some the architecture the actual architecture of the of the of the thing. So here on this example you can see two separated uh, team driver instances. Uh, on the left side, on the bottom you you have the kernel space, and on the on the top you have uh, the user space part. And as you can see, uh, ETH zero and ETH one uh, network interfaces are uh, teams together using team driver into team zero interface. And uh, on the top, the team D is running one instance, one process of team D controls one instance of uh, team driver in kernel space. And uh, uh, the team D consists of two main parts, the lib team, which does the, uh, the wrapping of the, of the netlink communication. And uh, the second part is the, the brain of the operation, I would say, is the runner. And uh, for example, if the, if the link aggregation type is active backup, and let's say that ETA zero is currently active port, and the traffic goes through that. Uh, and let's say that the, the link fails, and the, uh, the kernel part detects the failure, and it sends the event to the, to the user space part, and the runner uh, receives this event and can react, react to it appropriately by selecting some other uh, port to, to take over. And in this case, uh, the ETA zero uh, will be selected uh, over command, uh, over, over some s sending some message over uh, team netlink. Um, yes, this is that is about what I wanted to say in this slide. Okay, so here is uh, some some table which uh, compares features. Some selected ones, there are not all of them there, but some interesting ones. Uh, as you can see, the, 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 the comparison is, of course, between bonding driver and team driver, because they are trying to do the similar thing. Uh, as you can see, uh, both of them uh, support the, the basic uh, round robin and broadcast uh, transmit policy. Uh, the active backup policy is supported as well. Uh, what is interesting probably here is that uh, hash-based transmit policy uh, is, uh, no, I mean the, us the user can uh, set the, the hash function of which is actually used in hash-based TX policy, transmit policy uh, in team driver. Uh, which, can, which leads to much flexible setups. Uh, also, uh, TX load balancing can be, uh, can be used uh, for LACP protocol, which is also good because uh, every, uh, every 
smart switch supports LACP, actually. Um, yeah, another thing that uh, worth mentioning is that uh, Team Driver supports uh, neighbor discovery uh, IPv6 link monitoring. So you can, you can use uh, Team Driver in pure IPv6 uh, environment and do the link monitoring over this. Uh, also, uh, RCU, RCU locking is used uh, in kernel on, on transmit and receive paths. Uh, uh, if by team driver or in team driver, I noticed that uh, there has been some development in bonding driver in this uh, area as well, but uh, we'll see how it will go. Uh, Team driver supports also to set port priorities and to set the stickiness of the port. That means that if you have uh, active backup uh, runner set and uh, the port with better priority gains the link and the, the currently active one is set to be sticky, it, uh, it, it stays uh, active for for a longer time. Uh, this is somehow supported in bonding driver as well by setting primary uh, slave, but it's not that flexible as with port prioritization and stickiness. Uh, also, team driver supports to the separate port per port link monitoring setup. That means that you can use, uh, for ETA0, for example, you can use uh, ARP link monitoring, and for ETH1, uh, you can see, uh, you can use ETH2 monitoring. That's not possible for bonding, unfortunately. Uh, also, you can, you can set uh, multiple link monitoring solutions on, uh, on one or, or multiple ports together. That means that uh, bonding somehow supports this, uh, this as well. Therefore, I put limited uh, support here because uh, it only supports uh, multiple ARP targets. But with team, you can uh, set uh, how, how whatever combination you, of, of link monitoring solutions you want. OK. This, is, uh, this slide is about what uh, is planned for team driver in the future. As you can see, the, the network manager basic support is scheduled to be probably in Fedora 20. There is a feature page to this matter created. Uh, my wish is that uh, full GUI support it will be in Fedora 20 or 21. But we'll see about this. It's not, not decided yet. Uh, I also plan to support uh, receive balancing, uh, something which uh, bonding supports in LAB mode. But unlike bonding, I want to support it also as well as uh, if, the, if the bond is uh, part of the bridge or, or, or open vSwitch. And to achieve it, uh, uh, I want to use some kind of connection tracking, but we'll see about that. Uh, another interesting thing, I think this uh, is that uh, uh, Team Driver will eventually uh, support uh, auto configuration using LAD, LL, LLDP protocol, Link Layer Discovery protocol. Um, the, at the moment, uh, there are many uh, components, network switches, and other hardware that support this. Uh, and it would be probably good in combination of, with network manager for, net, uh, for system administrator. Uh, then if he can just uh, uh, create the team and put uh, several network interfaces in that, and that's it, without any configuration, and it just works. 
uh, what is currently working on uh, by my colleague Flavio is uh, extension of uh, transmit hash functions uh, uh, setups. Uh, we have at the moment some predefined protocols uh, like IP4, IPv6, and ETH. And uh, f in the future, we plan to support UDP, TCP, SCTP, and other, other uh, layer 4 protocols as well. Uh, probably there is plan to, uh, to allow user to actually put, uh, to actually, uh, to actually uh, use configuration to, uh, to, uh, to support any protocol he wants. He can define what, uh, what data uh, he wants to use to compute the, the, the hash. Uh, another thing which is planned is uh, is uh, extension of uh, Team D API. At the moment, uh, the API is uh, consists of <coughs> five uh, five functions on the bus. Uh, I I would like to see it uh, to be full featured and probably wrapped by by some kind of library so it can be used uh, by network manager, for example, uh, easily. Uh, but that's not decided yet as well. Uh, another thing which is on my wish list for, uh, for future is, uh, is to provide possibility for, for administrator or user to just create uh, standalone application, for example, in Python on, or some other uh, language, and to just communicate with Team D Core via some kind of API, and to, pro to provide runner uh, functionality in this standalone process. Yeah, that's about it. If you want to learn more about Team Driver, I uh, put the some more slides in my presentation. So if you can, if you download it, just you can just look at it and learn more. <coughs> okay. So if you have some questions, please ask. Okay. Yeah, I, I did some measurements, and my colleague did some measure, measurements as well, and uh, uh, it is it is. Uh, Pretty much the same. There are no uh, differences. Uh, also, if you if you just set the plain network interface card and measure the throughput, and uh, to set bonding over it and measure the throughput, there are also practically no differences there. So, uh, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. It's time for LVM presentation. My name is Daniel Kablaj, and I work for Red Hat in LVM team development. So my primary focus now will be on the LVM user space part of the project. But I will also mention some kernel issues here. 
Uh, but since the talk was well hidden in the conference schedule, I doubt that many people here are just for LVM talk, but to somehow organize the presentation, I would like to know how many of you are aware of what the LVM2 is and how it works? Who is using that actively? Who heard something about the thin provisioning? Oh, great. So you have found things in the paper. OK, so. So what the talk will be about. Uh, I will try to update you about what's new in the thin provisioning support in LVM mainly, because in the kernel part, this, this piece is always at least half a hit of the user space part. So we will talk mainly about the LVM part. I will show you some examples and uh, also tell a few words about limitations we currently have. So you should be aware that not everything is still 100% complete. So it's good to know where are the limits. So updates. Uh, how many of you were here last year when the Joe was giving the thin provisioning main presentation? No, not many of you. At that time, we had some basic LVM support where you could create thin volume and thin pools and use it. From that time, of course, many fixes were, in, uh, were made and uh, users are starting to use it and start to report the problem. So as soon as someone found the pro problem, it's good to report it and we try to fix it. So a lot of fixes were made and uh, uh, also a new code has been added, uh, mainly LV convert and LV change code. So from the beginning, we had a problem that for thin pool, you have now two devices and one should be fast one and one is for the data devices. So users could typically could not set up a uh, thin pool easily because they could not select exactly where the metadata is stored and when the data are located. So now with LV convert, you actually can select it. I will show later some example. And with LV change, you can also set and change some parameters according to your needs. Uh, main improvements also related to kernel changes here is that now the thin uh, pool uh, could use um, more flexible chunk size. Uh, the first version could only go by the power of two. So it started with 64K, then you have 128 and so on. But if you are, for example, striping devices, you uh, and you have like three devices in the stripe, it's really not so simple to match uh, in power two the chunk size to get the optimal throughput. So now you have the much less restrictive limitation, 64K. So the chunk size could go on the multiplies of 64K, which is quite usable. Uh, how many of you were on the Lukash uh, Cherner presentation of uh, local file system updates? He was mentioning the discard importance. So with the thin provisioning, now you have three modes. One is the ignore. This is here mainly to tackle um, some performance problems where if there are some users who are sending discards a lot and the storage below is not uh, supposed to work with that, you can ignore it. No pass down basically means that the discard is processed inside a thin pool driver, but it's not being passed on to the underlying storage data device. Again, it might be worth to check if you have some performance problems with this card that you can limit uh, and avoid the uh, passing down the discard to the device below. And the default one is to pass down. So it means if the file system is using thin, vo thin volume and sends the discard, discards go through the thin pool, the, the data are released, 
and also if the RR is released, uh, then the discard is passed to the data volume. Uh, as of today, uh, upstream uh, Git has been enhanced with the external origin support, which is a new feature for today, <laughs> basically. And it's something uh, many people asked us to add support for. So before or before today, if you want to use the thin provisioning, you had to basically move all your data to thin pool. So you create a thin volume and you have to copy basically the logical volume to use it as a thin volume. Now with the external origin support, you can use or you can create a thin volume and use any other thin, uh, any other normal LV or any LV basically as an external origin. So basically like snapshot, you have the LV and you create a thin LV over that LV and any writes are going to the thin volume and any reads from places which are not yet provisioned are going through and are taken from the external origin device. So now some examples. Our highly complicated uh, user land tools are not yet at the level that they can read the minds of, from the users. So you have to really read the man page and find out the command line options. But they are not that hard, I guess. We try, usually we try hard to figure out the best way how to put them. So we have LV convert support to create thin, vol thin pool from other volumes. So basically, is that mouse? No. Okay. So. Which one? Okay. So LV convert thin pool, you basically pick a LV you have created. So you prepare the LV any size you want. You specify the name here, it will be the name of the thin, thin, uh, thin pool. You specify the pool metadata volume, again, any size up to 16 gigabytes. Chunk size in kilobytes and the uh, LV pool, thin pool is created. Uh, there is a new enhanced logic inside the LV which tries to estimate good size for metadata. So if you don't specify the, uh, okay. what, control shift, what's that? Jak se to zmáčkne? To je control shift. Jak se to zmáčká? To je to. Musíš si pustit to znovu v redingu. Jo, takhle. So, so if you do not specify the pool metadata, uh, some size will be calculated according to the size of the thin pool. Uh, the, we are targeting for metadata that should not be bigger than 120 megabytes, so chunk size and is selected according to, 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 to fit into this, into this size. So if you really want to know what you are doing and you, want, you have some willings to set something precisely, set it by the command line options. If you are going to let the command line tool decide some good options, you, don't, you actually have to specify only the thin pool and everything else will be calculated on its own. Creation of thin volume, uh, this was also last year shown. So basically you specify the virtual size, pool and the name and you are done. Snapshot easily. And uh, now the tricky part with the external origin. So 
as, as has been shown, the first LV convert can create a thin pool. Essentially, with the same command, you can also convert any other volume to external origin and use it as a thin volume with the external origin. So what, what the, the options here means? Thin pool is simple. That's the thin pool which either exists as a thin pool Thin, uh, or it's a plain volume which will be converted into thin pool with the same command. So if you like to do things step by step, you prepare some thin pool a heat, and this is the thin pool which exists, or you have a simple LV which will be converted into the thin pool, and chunk size and things like that will be deduced from the size of this volume. Now let's Pretend that volume with this name already exists in your VG. And you wanted to use it as a thin volume. So this volume could be anything you want. It could be normal linear volume. And you wanted to use it as a thin volume. To make it working, you have to pick the new name, which will be the name when the original volume will be moved to. So obviously, external origin must be read only, because if it's used by the thin, volume, thin pool and uh, writes are going through the thin volume, you cannot allow any writes to this volume anymore. So this volume will be read only. Could be used by multiple thin volumes at the same time. So if you have, if you have it, you can use it multiply. So, so you can create, for example, image of file system and use it for hundreds of snapshots at the same time from the one pool. So the origin name you specify will be the name of the external origin, and this volume will be turned into the thin volume. Here is some small example how the table or table or output from LVS command may look like. Where you can see that the origin will be from uh, could be from the pool if the if, if it was previously thin volume. We, we may have thin volume which will have the origin as as an external origin. We reuse the same field because uh, origins for the snapshots and external origins have technically the same meaning. You can also have normal snapshot, which is not, without the flex, it's not visible here, but basically uh, this is how some simple output will look like. And we advise users to just test combinations and play with it. I read the man pages. That's always a good thing. We, we, we spent a lot of time to write them, so it's, uh, we try to make them as precise as we can, obviously. But uh, if you find some, something which is not really understandable, don't be afraid. Send a message. And we, try, we will try to come with some better wording or something like that. So as we are running nearly out of time, some limitations. Uh, the size of metadata is something what could get you in the troubles. Um, users uh, try to use uh, thin uh, pools with very small sizes, like they started with, I don't know, 10 megabytes, and uh, thin um, and the command calculated some size of metadata according to this size. Obviously, it will start with the smallest possible size, which is two megabytes. And now the user decide to use it as a one terabyte device, which is, of course, a completely different, uh, uh, which has completely different sizing problems. So now there is some limited support to resize the metadata, but offline. And it's not yet well documented. We will try to fix it, but 
Um, still, users should be aware that when they are creating thin pools, they should select uh, size of metadata, uh, a heat, and if they plan to use it a lot, 300 megabytes is a good compromise here, for example. Stacked devices are complex to support. Uh, essentially, as I have shown the LV convert command, those pools you create, uh, you want to create from, those LVs could be any other types of LV, so you can have a, like a mirror rate, and you can use them for thin pool data and thin pool metadata devices, but um, at, for this moment, uh, the testing and things around how to fix if something goes wrong there is not yet at the ultimate level. So beware that you may hit into some corner cases where you will be left either on your own intelligence or you will have to ask for support on our list. And. Uh, Highly limited VGCFG restore, where you can restore um, VG metadata, but you have to use the force option, and you have to be sure what you are doing. So there is no check that the metadata in kernel are matching the metadata in user land. So if you do something wrong there, again, you may get into deep troubles. mailing list and repository. And if you want to know more about LVM, also some good papers could be found here. And I think it's now time for, short time for questions. So any questions? No questions? Mm. They support basically the same thing, but on the uh, Yeah, but uh, I have not been doing that myself. Uh, and uh, com we just compare the speed against the native raw speed of devices. When if you have some decent chunk sizes, you are practically performing at the same level as the raw device you have. So. I'm not sure how, how much slower the QCOW devices are, but with thin provisioning, you are basically at the level of uh, raw devices. There are some percentage differences, but not really major one. Uh, also, one thing, tomorrow is the presentation from Jen Brussel at the morning about the storage meeting LVM. So there will be far, far more time to discuss it. Okay? Yeah? Uh, well, for 6.4, it's targeted to be supported. So, RHEL 6.4 should have thin provisioning supported. Clustering. Uh, currently, it's not supported with for two, uh, 14 volumes in other any other way than the exclusive activation. And in fact, there is a small bug, or well, not small one, but <laughs> uh, you should not try to activate uh, thin volumes on different cluster nodes from the one pool, which you could actually do, but you should not do that. Basically. <laughs> As you can see, there's a bug, and uh, currently you can uh, activate thin, thin volumes from the same pool on multiple nodes, which is something you don't really want to. So be aware that you should use it only on one cluster node. Yeah, out of time.